Okay, so we are recording, Jake. And um, second hour AP class, we're going to review our notes on encoding. We read about this last night. And to guide us, I put a, a few pre-questions up here so we could kind of use these questions to glom on the information that we, we come across in our text and our Cornell notes. Those questions were basically, what information do we encode automatically and what is automatic processing? What information do we encode effortfully and how does distributed practice influence retention or the ability to keep information in our memory system? There's a couple people that are going to be important in this section. They come up on the AP test quite frequently. Um, Ebbinghaus, which was the late 1800s, um, we've got Barrick in the 1990s. Um, we've got Craig and Talving and Gordon Bauer, which we'll talk about in a different section. Uh, they're going to talk a little bit more about visual and acoustic encoding. But how do we encode information? It's really twofold. So we actually we included a graph here, and anytime you can add some type of visual representation, a visual organization part, it helps with encoding. And we're going to talk about automatic and effortful encoding, something that occurs without effort and something that occurs with effort. So we're going to take a look at automatic processing. First, um, I always remembered automatic processing involves parallel processing. This term is going to be important in a, in, in a couple other units, um, in sensation unit and in our um, brain unit, our neural unit. And parallel processing is kind of like your brain's ability to multitask. And that's a term that you've all heard of several times uh, over the course of this class. And multitasking may not be good for us, but for our brain below conscious awareness, it's very efficient. Um, some examples of automatic processing in your life that you do on a daily basis is we often encode information about space or our environment without even trying to. For example, if I ask you to share with people, hey, tell us about how you got to school today, or how did you get from first hour to this classroom? You didn't try to rehearse that, but that information's probably there. Um, just like you probably can locate information on the page of a textbook that you read days ago. Oh, I remember what that page looked like. So we often encode information about environmental locations automatically. Um, sequence of events or order of events often gets encoded automatically. This may allow us to find lost items because we can backtrack and we can follow our footsteps um, to find lost uh, items, whether it's your cell phone or your backpack um, or where you left something in the commons area. Frequency, how many times did you? For example, how many times did you see your friend yesterday, your parents yesterday? How many times did you eat yesterday? How many times did you brush your teeth? Frequency of actions often gets encoded automatically. And if we try to retrieve it, um, what happened yesterday, today, we probably could do a pretty good job of it. And this is important for students. Uh, things that you struggle learning now with continued practice can actually become automatically processed later. Things that we take for granted like walking or writing or speaking in our own language, that's well-learned information that has become automatic for you, and we'll talk about where that's stored in our brain a little bit later. So what is difficult now can be automatic, and that, that can be study procedures, which are difficult for you to follow now. If you're trying to change how you study, but if you do it often enough, it will become habit for you. An example in our book was um, this statement right here. Hopefully you got to try that. And reading backwards is something most of us don't do on a daily basis. But um, effortful processing can become automatic. For seasoned readers like you, for good readers, it probably wouldn't take very long for us to start reading a textbook that was entirely written backwards. And we do it very quickly and easily without much time or practice. <coughs> As we move on, we're going to talk about effortful processing. There's a little bit more information here because this involves a lot more of our actual daily practice or routine. So effortful requires attention. And we've been speaking about this most of the class hour, attention and how it's divided. It can screw up your ability to encode information. 
Um, rehearsal is something that a lot of us do. How many of us have done note cards studying for a test? Most of our hands do go up. That is basically conscious repetition. And does it work? Yes, it does. It can produce more durable memories. But it is the shallowest form of rehearsal. It is the shallowest form of encoding. It does help, but it's not the best way we can encode information. Ebbinghaus, the grandfather of the study of memory, late 1800s, early 1900s, decided to scientifically study the effectiveness of rehearsal. And I'm not sure if this is in your book, but he didn't want to use words that he already knew, like dog and cat and flower, because that those words had meaning. He wanted to create new words that had no meaning, so he literally had to effortlessly process letter by letter. And he created something called CBCs, which is a consonant, a vowel, be squeezed between another consonant. And here's some examples. And he created thousands of these words and created lists of about 20 of them and then studied them until he re re recalled them 100% accurately. And then he put the list aside and one day later, two days later, or a week later, tried to recall that list. How well do you think he did? Not very, didn't do very well. But he then said, well, is the memory totally gone? And he tried to remember the list. So um, he studied a second time. And what he found was the more times he rehearsed on the first practice, the less time it took him the second time to learn the whole list, which supports the statement, the amount remembered depends on the time spent learning. Another way to say this, and I think this was in your textbook, that um, if it's quickly learned, it's probably quickly forgotten. And as a student, this is going to be important for you as we study for that AP test in the future, that if you do things really quick and, and, and shortcuts now, that's going to have an impact on, on how well you remember the information later on. This relates to overlearning. A couple other um, concepts that, that we'll talk about. Even after material is learned, and you know that material, one or two additional practices can really make that information more durable. So yeah, I know this stuff. Review it one more time in that morning, the next morning. Um, or I already know my, my research method stuff. Gosh, you know, if, if you're sitting there watching um, uh, a TV show, if you spent 10 minutes just looking over those notes again, the ability for you to recall it later on um, is pretty impressive. Mass practice, we, I told you not to do that. Um, kidding. We looked at a chart yesterday, and we kind of did a little study. If this is your test day, and there's many test days leading up to that, and this is the frequency of your study time that most people study down here. They don't study them the night before or the right before that test. They do all their studying. That's mass practice. And mass practice does produce speedy short-term knowledge of information, uh, and it creates this feeling of, boy, I'm really smart and I know stuff, but the information doesn't tend to last very long. So long-term retention is typically not um, very impressive. What is impressive is the spacing effect. Distributed practice produces better long-term retention. So for a unit like this, you should start studying on the first day. And as you continue to do your work, you want to, you want to go back to the previous day and look at over your, your Cornell notes for maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes even um, is going to produce long-term knowledge that will stay and last longer. Is there evidence to support this? There is. Harry Barrick used his family members to study foreign language translations, and aren't you glad he wasn't your dad? Um, he studied terms a given number of times, and then over intervals ranging from 14 days later to 56 days later. And what they found was the longer the space between the initial learning and the second practice session, whether it was 14 days or 56 days, the longer the, the longer the space between the first and second, the better they remember those terms five years later. So if we learn a list of terms and we have it down perfectly and we study it 14 days later and then we don't look at those terms for another five years, 
um, or we, we had 56 days between the first and second time. This group remembered it much better five years later. So the good news for teachers, but the bad news for you guys may be, this is evidence that semester exams help. It, it helps with retention. That if we make you study, if you're motivated like you guys are, to do well on those tests, and you have to re rehearse that material again or learn it again, the retention years later is going to be better if we have semester exams and if we don't. There's also some evidence fairly recently about repeated testing of material um, leads to greater retention. And that doesn't mean me testing you all the time. It means you testing yourself, not just reviewing the words, but literally testing yourself and asking yourself questions, which is Cornell notes comes in handy. You can cover up one side of the notes and quiz yourself based on the other side of the notes, right? A couple other quick phenomena that we notice when we study memory, um, when we're trying to remember a list of terms, which one do we remember the best? Well, in the list, we tend to, the serial position effect matters. We tend to remember the first word in the list and the last word in the list better than the other terms if rehearsed or recalled right away. And primacy effect would explain why we remember the first one, because it's the one that's rehearsed the most often. In the study we just did before this, we remember the first two statements better than we remember the middle statements. More people recalled it. And we also tended to remember the last couple of statements better because they're still maybe in our short-term memory uh, because we recalled it within a minute of remembering things. So primacy is first, recency is second. So remember, we want to look at those questions. How do we automatically and effortfully retrieve information? Um, you guys have been a wonderful audience. Hopefully you enhanced your retrieval.